If ever, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, my Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus is now if ever there there will come a, a point in your journey when your circumstances and your pain will push you into the love of Jesus it is only that love that can love you back to wholeness we have bad sayings in our culture we tell people, I love you to death. But no, I love you to life. If ever, I love thee. Forgive me for the, um, I believe our protocol has been established already. And I'm grateful on tonight to be here with you all in, in this gathering, in this session. It has been my deep privilege to be here these days and to have met these tremendously gifted preachers and pastors and to have met this dynamic moderator and his cabinet and persons whom I consider friends and newfound friends. And thank God for those who stood in the shoes prior to Reverend Branch, Dr. Curry and Dr. Taylor Tonight, I want to talk about Jesus. And um, there's a passage of scripture that I have preached numerous times, different places, as we all do who preach. Tonight, as I was sitting there and I looked at the scripture, it is amazing how your current circumstances have a way of shifting your perspective. It is why we can read the same scriptures over and over again and come to new places, not because the scripture has changed, but because our circumstances have. I want tonight, as you stand with me, to look at a passage that I believe probably every preacher in here has preached at one time or another. So much of this may not be new, but something st stood out to me tonight. In that story, as it is recorded by the writer of Mark, it is found in the fifth chapter of the gospel bearing that name. It is a story of the man called Legion. <laughs> Listen to Dr. Taylor talk about last night, it's amazing how God will find you in your hiding places. In the dark corners of the places we thought we could get away from God. 
I, I will not read this story in its entirety, but I want to lift three lines from this story found in the fifth chapter. The first line I want to lift is in the last portion of the fourth verse. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And the last portion of the first, four, fourth verse, rather, says, and no one had the strength to subdue him. And then, if you go down to verse 10, it says, he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And then if you go to verse 17, then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. Let's pray. God, we bless your name on tonight. We are grateful. Grateful, oh God, that you've given us the strength and capacity to reciprocate your love. We love you. We love you, God. If we're honest, there are moments when we are baffled as to why you love us so much. But we thank you that your love is undergirded by your grace. If only you, oh God, could forgive and love the way you do. And all of us here tonight are eternally grateful that you still do both. Now, God, break through us tonight. For there are some of us, oh God, who have become stern and stubborn because the pain has been deep and intense. Break through us tonight. So that we might feel real liberation. Break through us, God. So that we can begin, oh God, to be lifted in ways we did not anticipate. Because some of us were not even looking for our breakthrough. Have your way. And we'll be sure to give you all the honor and the glory. Because you are worthy. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing with me. Allow me to read those verses again. Portion of verse 4. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Verse 10. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And verse 17. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. You can take a seat tonight. Last night I spoke about notes from a traumatized leader. Tonight I want to speak from the thought, notes from the edge of insanity. Notes from the edge of insanity. There are some levels of demonic encounter that those of us who are not honest about who we are will never be able to defeat. I know that many of us believe that with God, all things are possible. And that is true. But there are times when the possibility is not connected to God, 
but the impossibility is connected to you. It is when we are not honest enough to be able to admit levels of weakness. Truthfully, it is the confession of weakness that has a tendency to make a way for God's strength. This is why it is really counterproductive to boast in strength when your strength has a start date and an end time. But Paul pierces our rational minds by telling us that it is the end date of our strength that makes way for the start date of God's power. When I am weak, then I become strong. For his strength is perfected. Oh, I wish I had time tonight. In my weakness, that the perfection nature of God's power is connected to the diminishing nature of my strength. When I am weak, then God is strong. But what happens to strength potential when I can't be honest about my weakness? I have to say again, there are some levels of the demonic that we can never confront or overcome if we are not honest about our weakness. That means if we're not honest about our weakness, every attempt to encounter, confront, overcome the demonic will be a moment of exposure for my inability to be honest about my weakness. I'm going to help you with this one tonight. What motivated their dishonest engagement? Maybe he was a friend. Maybe he was a loved one. Maybe he was brother, uncle, father. Whatever he was, he meant something to them. Every night they could hear him wailing in the wind. Cry out from the tombs. They would hear his ravenous tauntings all night long and something about them inclined them to want to help him. They loved him and knew him. They worked with him and journeyed with him. And so they dared to venture into dead places for where he dwelt was among the tombs. They would leave their places of rest and safety and security and they would venture to the tombs, not empty handed, but with chains. In their mind, what was controlling him was uh, 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 possibly something that could be bound by them. Oh, come on, y'all got to hear this today. And so there were moments where they, because of the motivating factor of their love and relationship with him, that they would grab the chains and they would make their way up to the dead places among the dead people to visit their dead friend. And they would take the chains and, and Dr. Taylor, they would bind his wrists and bind his feet thinking that they could bind the demonic that was binding the man. But the problem was you can't bind in dishonesty. Because you cannot expect to engage some levels of the demonic if you are not honest about your own weakness. How were they going to buy? 
bind him when they could not even bind themselves. They all had issues as we. They all had problems as we. But the problem comes when you have the audacity to think that you can help somebody else confront their crisis and you're unwilling to confront your own crisis. That means that any attempt you do to bind someone else's problem unless you're unable to look at your own issue is disingenuous, fraudulent, and will be revealed as false. They would bind him. But their bindings were a reflection of their weakness. Their chains were a reflection of their weakness. That's why every time they went to bind him, the record said he would break the chains. Because if you look at that fourth verse in the latter part, it says because they did not have strength to subdue him. How can you get strength if you can't confront your own weakness? There's some things right now that you will never be able to bind because you don't make way for the perfecting strength of God. At some point in your journey, you got to be able to say, Lord, without you, I am nothing. They would try to bind him. And did not have strength to do it. Quite possibly because they were not weak enough to call for it. That is on the edge of insanity. When you think you can be strong without admitting your weakness. How insane is that? All of us in here are here because at some point we came face to face with our limitations. There was some point along the journey where we realized that after we had exhausted everything we could use, that the only way we were able to overcome where we were was because God poured into us. And oh my God, how can you pour into a, a vessel that is already full of itself? So the only way you can pour in is when the vessel has been empty or willing to be emptied in order to be filled with that which does not come from within but comes from God. Uh, but hold on, let me correct this. It is not that it cannot come from within because Jesus helped us understand that the kingdom of God is within. And if the kingdom of God is the dwelling place of God, that means that when we tap into God, we tap into ourselves. So that means then that it could possibly mean that the strength we often seek is a strength we already possess. But part of the problem is that we can't access it because we think we already own it. We do not understand that the strength we can tap into, the strength we already possess, comes as a gift from God. But the access point to the gift from God comes by admitting one's own weakness. God, I need you right now. And the only reason I can move forward in this moment is because if I do not have you in my life, nothing can become possible. Now let me just translate this for some of y'all who are looking at me funny. Get over yourself. You better tell somebody that I'm standing here because if it had not been for the power of God in my life, I don't know where I would be. Yeah. They could not subdue him because, Baron, they weren't strong enough. But probably because they weren't weak enough. That is the counter logic of the kingdom of God. Weak strength. Lowly elevated. It is the economy of the kingdom of God. 
it runs counter to our thought process. And that is why the world is often confused by it because the world is trying to fence the, fit the economy of God into our rational sensibilities and the economy of God always assaults our rational sensibilities. There is no way in the world you can tell me it makes sense that a dying man on the cross has salvific power. It is the economy of the kingdom. And so they learn that there are some ways you can only confront demons. That's when you've been emptied enough to become strong enough. Until one day when after human inability to confront the demonic had been brought to the fore. The scripture says a boat showed up off the coast of the Gadarenes. I wish I had time. I know it's late, but, but you have to. You have to understand the arrival point of Jesus comes at the end point of the people's inability. He shows up after they've been tapped out. You've got to hear that today. Jesus arrives on the shore on the coast of the Gadarenes. But my brothers and my sisters, you have to understand the context to the arrival to make sense of the delivery. Oh, you'll get this in a second. Uh, Jesus has been teaching those who are willing to listen. He has been mixing in wisdom knowledge with parables. And he has been on a long run of teaching. And then at the end of the teaching that comes in uh, uh, Mark 4, Jesus then says to his disciples, we must go to the other side. Now, now here is a thing. He says we must go. Now, this is important. That means that there's something on the other side that is compelling Jesus to take the journey with his disciples to the other side. You can miss this. He said we must go, which would suggest there is no option in this moment. And Jesus is directive is connected to what is waiting on the other side he said we must go now what is deep about this Janelle is that when Jesus says we must go his actions are not connected to the boat and the participants his actions are connected to what waits on the other side and so what does Jesus go do in anticipation of what is on the other side he takes a nap you didn't catch this he's resting in preparation for where he's going we miss this he's not resting for fatigue he's resting for welfare you're not hearing me he's getting ready for what is waiting we must go because there's something waiting on the other side that will now cause me to use a power that I know is within me. The others could not handle it, but I must rest to perform the works of my father. But you see, because they don't understand the nature of Jesus' directive, they get confused by the opposition. Oh, hold on. Y'all missed that. A storm arises. <laughs> and all they see is the storm. Now, clearly, Jesus is not concerned about the storm because he's resting in preparation for what is on the other side. But they see the storm and they get concerned. Here comes the edge of insanity. They get concerned and their fear, their trembling now causes them to question the commitment Jesus has made to them. Their fear and their trembling causes them now to question the nature of the relationship that Jesus has with them. That is insane because now in that moment of fear and trembling in which they question the nature of the relationship they have with Jesus, in that very moment they forgot what they've already seen. Come on, you're not here. They, they don't come to the storm without experience. They come to the storm with experience. And if you come to the storm with experience, why in the world are you scared when the storm shows up? You tell somebody, I've been here before. And the same God that brought me out last time is the same God who bring me out this time. And is there anybody here who can testify I've been here before? In fact, look at your neighbor and tell the neighbor I need you to know something. Even though I'm in the midst of hell, I was built for this. 
this moment. I was made for this moment. He created me for this moment because greater is he that is in me than he that is. But they didn't understand. Look at the question in Victorian English. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus rises from his slumber and does not deal with them because Jesus understands that there must be preparation before the moment. You thought this text was about the disciples' fear. It was Jesus preparing for what he would confront. And so now after rest, he opens his mouth. Peace, be still. He's getting ready. Because if he could speak to the storm on the sea, he could speak to the storm on the shore. You didn't catch that. Because there's a storm waiting for him. And I got news for some of y'all in here tonight. I saw it is so glad to know that every now and again, God will go through my storm to get to my storm. You didn't hear me. He'll go through it to get to it. Can I help somebody here? Then he'll go through a mess to find me in a mess. He'll go through hell to pull me out of my hell. He'll go through a storm to pull me out of a storm. And I'm so glad tonight that he's not ashamed to hang out with some folk who got some some issues, who got some problems, who got some tendencies, because he loves. He goes through a storm to get to a storm. And when he arrives on the shore, the man runs. Can you see him? Matted hair. Disheveled face. Can you see him? The remnants of the chain still hanging on his wrists and feet. So that every step he took, you could hear the clinging and the clanging. And every time those chains banged against one another, it was a deeper sign of human inability to confront the demonic. The clanging and the clanging escort his direction towards Jesus. The rivulets of dry blood now causing rivers along his already bruised arms. The story said that he would often take stones to cut away himself. And those who did not understand what he was doing thought he was trying to hurt himself. But when you've been possessed by so many things, you'll do anything to cut away the layers of possession. That man runs to Jesus. And he falls down before him. When he comes to Jesus, he cries out, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, I adjure you by God, please don't torment me. The man is speaking. Please don't mess with me. Because right now, the only reason, Jesus, I'm able to talk to you is because the demons have given me a break. But Jesus, if you come, you might wake them up and I won't be able to enjoy this moment of temporary reprieve. Please don't stir up the pot, Jesus. Don't, 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 don't mess with me. I adjure you by God. Please leave me alone because I don't want you to awaken those things that have held me captive for so long. Can you imagine the man is asking Jesus to leave him alone because he does not want the demons disrupted? Please leave me. And Jesus does not pay attention. Look at it right there. He does not pay attention to it. The writer of Mark says that Jesus had already called them out before the man uttered a word. The writer places that parenthetically and lets you know that Jesus had already spoke to them before he spoke to him. Before he engages the man, he engages the things that had the man. 
the man wasn't privy to that conversation because the conversation was not with him, it was with them. He spoke to them and told them to come out before he spoke to him. And when he began to speak, the man who was possessed, he made the assumption that Jesus had not dealt with them yet. But he did not understand that part of the dormancy of the demons was because Jesus had already spoken to them. So before he spoke to him, he spoke to them and already told them to leave him alone. Oh, my God. Now, Jesus wants to see as whether or not his words have taken root yet. Remember, he spoke to them before he spoke to him. And then after he spoke to him, he speaks to him again. He said, what is your name? What is your name? Oh, my brothers and sisters, I know it is late, but you must understand that when Jesus raises this poignant question, it must have been an eruption in this man's spirit because it had been a long time since anyone had bothered to know who he was because they made the assumption that he was his demons. You didn't get this. They made the assumption that he was synonymous with that which was possessing him. And so nobody ever asked him who he was because they assumed that who he was was connected to who they were. And so they never bothered to know who he was because because they thought his identity was connected to the demon. It is a dangerous thing when people think they know you because they know your issue. You, you gotta tell people, you might know my issue, but you don't know my story. Hey, you might know what I've been to, but you don't know who's bringing me out. Yeah, I gotta hurry up here, here, here. Here, 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 listen, listen, listen. What is your name? And in that very moment, the man begins to wrestle with himself. What is my name? What, what, is, what is my name? What is my name? What is my name? I, I do have a name. It's, it's been a long time since anyone asked me my name, but I do have a name. I do have a name. In the midst of the wrestling, Dr. Taylor, the demons are still dormant. My, what is my name? 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 He asked me, but I forgot. I, I cannot see myself apart from what my, my name is. Legion, for we are many. Now, understand in that very moment, there's dueling sensibilities because you just saw the definition of schizophrenia. Watch this. There's some demons that only wake up when you seek to assert yourself. He said, my name is singular. He was preparing to name himself after a long period of possession. When the demons realized he was about to assert himself, they took him back in. The sentence starts singular but ends plural. He begins it but the demons finish it. My name is, they say, Legion for we. Because they pull him back. My name is Legion. For we are many. I won't bother you tonight, but I know this may be hard to understand because it was thought that a legion of demons was connected to a legion of Roman soldiers, which was about 2,000 soldiers. To think that this man could have had 2,000 demons running reckless in his spirit is incomprehensible. It's only incomprehensible to some of us because we have not learned how to really name demons. And primarily because we have not learned to name demons. These were possessing demons. These were demons who had a hold of the man who had lost himself in them. Oh, I'm going to help you reimagine demons because you're not thinking about demons that make you foam in the mouth, go crazy. Demons are those things that have a possession of you that cause you to lose a sense of who you are. So the question becomes, what is your demon tonight? What is the thing that has a hold of you that has caused you to lose a sense of your identity, that you're so connected to it that you can't see yourself aside from it? What is your demon tonight? Maybe your demon is called false piety. You come to church with a pretentious praise, with a false worship. You come because you've realized that the best hiding place to not have to confront who you really are is in church while people are distracted by the praise party. Yes, sir. 
And so your demon that has you becomes your false sense of arrival because you have now over spiritualized your inability to confront your own issue. And so instead of confronting it, you praise it away. You shout it away. You dance it away. And now the thing that is holding you has a grip of you. Because why? Because the thing that you're trying to hide in church now actually possesses you. But in dysfunctional ways, because you hold on to it for dear life, afraid of being exposed in church. And so you begin to put on a false pretense of who you think you are and let people think that you're so holy, so sanctified, so blood washed and blood bought that they make assumptions about your moral behavior because you're afraid to be real about yourself. And so you come to church and lie. What's your demon? Maybe your demon has a different name and maybe your demon is called dysfunctional love. And when does dysfunctional love begin to possess you? It is when you lack the ability to love yourself in such a dysfunctional way that you think you can find love in other people. And so you begin to look for love, fall in love, but you're not really trying to fall in love with the other person. You're trying to think that you can fall in love with you by falling in love with somebody else. Trying to use someone as a conduit to your own place that you're afraid to confront. So you told me you were in love, but you really weren't in love with the other person because how can you even love someone else if you don't know how to love yourself? Let me move on. Listen, what is your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. Are you watching this? Verse 10. Edge of insanity 2. It is a line preachers that is often overlooked. Verse 10. The man who Jesus came to deliver then becomes the advocate for the demons. The man, Dr. Taylor begs Jesus not to send them out of the country. Hold on. They've been possessing you. Now you're defending them. And the only way you would defend your demons is if you can't imagine life without them. It's one thing when people think that you are synonymous with your issues. It is another thing when you believe you are synonymous with your issues. Where you have problematized your own existence in such a way that you can't imagine life without the dysfunction, without the chaos, without the issues, without the problem. And so you create a, 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 a habitat in your pain because you're afraid to confront your freedom. You come to church and tell people you want to be delivered, but you don't really want to be delivered because to be delivered means you have to be available for the deliverance. And you're not really available for the deliverance because you're afraid of being delivered because deliverance means now liberation. And most of us have been walking in chains for so long they can't even imagine what it looks like to walk without the chains. You've been limping for so long you don't even know what it looks like to walk up straight. You've been walking with your back bent over for so long you can't imagine seeing trees for the first time. Please don't send them away, Jesus, because I've grown used to the thing that's trying to kill me. I'm comfortable with it. I like it around. It's not the best for me, but I'm afraid to try anything else. Don't be so desperate that you start making excuses for your demons. For that is the definition of insanity. Okay, I'm done. He says, okay, fine. He, uh, he, uh, he says, fine. He casts them out. He casts them into the pigs. The pigs run down the embankment, jump in the sea. They drown. He casts the demons out of the man, casts them into the pigs. The pigs run down the embankment, go to the sea, and they drown. He casts them out the man. He casts them into the pigs. The pigs go crazy, run down the embankment, jump into the sea, and they drown. They commit swine suicide. Now, I really, I wasn't going to stay here, but you missed it, so I'm going to back up. When the demons left the man, they went into the pigs. The pigs ran down the embankment, jumped into the sea, and they drowned. Okay? The same demons 
that were in the man caused the pigs to kill themselves, but they could not kill the man. Hold on. See, the miracle already took place. There's some of y'all in here right now. There's some stuff that should have took some of y'all out a long time ago. But you know that the only reason, hey, that you're here tonight is because God can't shoot. Look at your neighbor and say, my God is a keeper. He's kept me through some dangerous toils and snares. He, he kept me. Is there anybody in here tonight who can testify that I serve a keeper? Tell him again, he's keeping me. I should have been dead, but I'm still here. I should have been gone, but I'm still here. And is there anybody here who got a praise of God? Tell your neighbor I got staying power. Here, here, and the swine herders lose their mind. Insanity number three, that they are perturbed. Because instead of seeing the healing, they saw the loss of business. Uh, their pigs are gone. Forget the fact that the man they've been trying to help is now delivered. It's amazing when people can't see your deliverance because they're busy looking at what they've lost. They can't even focus on rejoice with you because they're busy thinking about what they don't have. I wish I had somebody who could tell the truth in here tonight. There's some folk right now who can't even rejoice with you because they're only looking at what they don't have and what you got. But you got to tell some folks, stop hating on me. If you can't handle what the Lord is doing in my life, get away from me. Because if you think I'm praising God now, it does not yet appear what my praise will look like. Here. Yeah. He said they were confused. Because he was clothed and in his right mind. As long as you're broke up, there's folk who stay around you. As long as you're busted, there's some folk who stay around you. But as soon as God gets you back together again, then you can see who your real friends are. I know you can pray for me, but I want to know can you praise with me for the great things God has done. Listen, 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 I'm gone. I'm gone tonight. I'm gone, but let me say this. And I'll take my seat. The man comes to Jesus. And I'm done with this. He comes to Jesus. He said, Lord, I want to go with you. I want to stay connected to the power. But Jesus says... No, because you are not too newly delivered not to get an assignment. Oh, hold on. You mean to tell me that even though I'm just getting used to my freedom, God still trusts me with a assignment? That he still calls me even though I'm still fresh out of my chaos? He still trusts me even though I'm just fresh out of my trouble? He said, yeah, I know you might not be used to being free, but while you're free, let me give you something to do. He said, I don't want you to hang out with me because you've already seen the power. He said, go tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. I wish I had a handful of y'all here tonight who could testify that you know what the Lord has done for you. You know what the Lord has brought you through. So instead of looking at me like I'm crazy, you better tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. And is there anybody here who's got a testimony? Tell somebody I used to be crazy, but then he called me. I almost lost my mind, but then he brought me back. Is there anybody here who can give God some praise? Look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, you might not understand what I've been through. You might not understand the hell I've been catching. You might not understand the rough days I've been having. But look me in the eye right now. The fact that I'm still here 
is a testimony that he walks with me. He talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let those who've been brought through say so. Tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. Is there anybody who's got a testimony? Is there anybody who's got a testimony? Is there anybody who's got a testimony? I wish I had somebody here tonight who's got a testimony. In fact, look at your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, let me share with you what the Lord has done for me. He brought me a mighty long way. He brought me a mighty long way. Grab your neighbor's hand and tell him, neighbor, we about to give God some praise in this place. Look him in the eye and tell him, neighbor, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, oh, he's done for me, my soul, my soul, my soul cries out. one more thing tell a neighbor I got to give him glory I got to give him praise because God has been good to me because God has been good to me is there anybody here who can testify that the Lord has been good to you oh come and magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name and give him praise. Taste and see that the Lord is good. For the Lord is great and greatly, 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 greatly. greatly.